Now, obviously, when you look back in WWF and WWE history, you have, you have plenty of moments that make you go back and say, WTF. What in the fuck were they thinking? What the hell was the mindset? What the hell was the rationale? What was going on? Why, oh, why did they do that? And I'm sure with all over two decades of hindsight now, a lot of people are like me. They look back at King of the Ring 1999. And it still, to this day, is a WTF thing. It frankly was back in 1999, and that hasn't changed. It's only gotten more so over the years. You just sit there and you say, Billy Gunn? That's the direction you were going? That's what you decided you wanted to do? Why, oh, why? And I guess we will talk a little bit about that here in just a moment or two. But King of the Ring 1999, like obviously this is WWE in kind of the peak of the Attitude Era. You've got Austin, you've got Rock, you've got Taker, you've got Kane, you've got Big Show, you've got all these freaking big name talents and so forth. You still have the fragments of DX, you have China, like I go on and on and on. You still got Ken Shamrock even and da 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 da. But, you know, from just a pure like, if you really are in hardcore into the in-ring components, the match stuff, a show like this absolutely is not for you. Because if anything, this is more an epitome of what you would get during that time. The characters were great, entertaining, got you invested in what the hell they were doing. Um, segments sometimes were fantastic, sometimes were absolutely drizzly and embarrassing shits. And the matches sometimes, eh. Like from a pure action standpoint of the time that they got, which a lot of times wasn't much, they left quite a bit to be desired. Chances are somebody like me, having experienced this, you know, when it happened in 1999, will go back now and probably look at it a little bit more fondly that what a lot of you that maybe didn't watch it or aren't old enough to remember or from a different generation would certainly, certainly look at this and say, you'd look at this and say, yikes, this is what they did? This is, this is what you guys used to brag about? Yeah, and you know what? You're kind of right. Like, this one's not, not that great. Like, you have all your King of the Ring quarterfinal matches. Like, think about this. You've got um, X-Pac defeating a hardcore Holly by disqualification. You've got Kane defeating Big Show. You know, you had brought Big Show in at St. Valentine's Day Massacre, wasn't that, in February 99, where he threw Austin up against the cage and Austin dropped in the match against McMahon. Blah, 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 blah. And now here you're into summer and he's jobbing out in the quarterfinals of a King of the Ring match. Like, you don't bring in a guy like the Big Show and sit there and job him out like this, but that's exactly what the fuck they did. Like, I'm surprised Paul White ever got to the place that he got with WWE. I'm surprised that he had as much staying power and longevity, whether he liked it or not, as he did. Because, man, in the early days of him, like, they did him wrong. They did him dirty. <laughs> with tears that are soaked, I'm sad to hear that your daddy finally croaked. <laughs> you had Billy Gunn defeat Ken Shamrock by ref stoppage, which all comes back to the match that he had on the pre-show with Shane McMahon, where he ends up getting fucked up and he's bleeding. And, you know, you could see the strategy here of where they were trying to build up Billy Gunn. And I admit, I'm too lazy to go back and really think about or really research, like, what were the what were the thought processes or the decisioning points here of why they wanted to go with Billy Gunn like they did? I, I don't know. I really don't know. You know, because if anything, man, if you were ever talking about there was a year to maybe have had China win the King of the Ring... This probably would have been it. They went in a different DX direction, that's for damn sure. Because you had Road Dog defeat China, even though she had her boyfriend Hunter with her in the quarterfinal match. And you'll notice with all the King of the Ring matches, this one was by far the longest. It had a holy blessing from God. That's why it went a hell of a lot longer. Um, you had a Hardy Boys versus the Brood match that went less than five minutes. That was to determine the number one contender spot for the tag team championships think about that you had Ed edge and christian and the hardys and on king of the ring 1999 this match went less than five fucking minutes yikesies is all you could freaking say to that your two king of the ring semi-final matches x-pac 
uh, defeated Road Dog. And, you know, they had even built this up beforehand where they both of them had interviews and they're talking about, you know, how, you know, this is business and they're still friends and all of this and they're not doing all the semantics like they would normally do with their entrance. And then you go out there and try to tell the story in just over three minutes. Yikes. An example of you're trying to get through too much shit in an abbreviated amount of time here. That's, that was one of the challenges sometimes, I think, with the King of the Ring pay-per-view. Sometimes I talk about it as I go back and I review this series. It's kind of shining some light on, you know, the danger sometimes of nostalgia bias. And you sometimes long for these things where you realize that, you know what? It's not nearly what I've always made it out to be. And... The pay-per-view concept in and of itself, even though it was a one-time-a-year thing, created its own challenges. And a number of these King of the Ring shows weren't all that particularly good. Let's just keep it real. The other semi-final of the King of the Ring saw Billy Gunn defeat Kane. Now think about that. By hook or by crook, it doesn't matter. In the first two rounds, they had Bill, Mr. Ass, not even just Billy Gunn, but Mr. Ass, beat Ken Shamrock by a ref stoppage, and beat fucking Kane, which got him to the finals of King of the Ring, where he defeated X-Pac, and again, like you're trying to build up Mr. Ass Billy Gunn here, and you're doing it in a bunch of short matches, but you've thrown a couple of monsters in to speak. I know Shamrock wasn't a huge guy, but I mean, he's a legit fucking badass, so he's a monster in that sense, and then Kane is fucking Kane. He's a monster in his own sense. But Billy Gunn, King of the Ring winner, now look, Billy Gunn was a good talent. Billy Gunn had had his time with the company and, you know, the smoking guns gimmick and so forth, but really had kind of found himself with DX and the New Age Outlaws and so forth. Um, but man, it's no wonder The Rock buried him on the road to SummerSlam 99. Because, I mean, if you look at the Mr. Ass gimmick and you just look at Billy Gunn, like at that time especially... Good hand to have, quality hand, but didn't have the charisma or personality of a true WWF main eventer, didn't have the work that you would necessarily require of a WWE main eventer. The look was okay, but certainly didn't seem like it was main event worthy. Like you had a lot of mid-card, upper mid-card type of stuff, and I understand sometimes you got to give people an opportunity, you got to take some chances and see how they work out. But I can't imagine 1999 when you're still thinking about King of the Ring of being a platform where you can launch and elevate somebody to that next level. I'm not really sure what the thought process was here. I'm just not. Because it didn't work. And even when you go back and look at it and you look at the different factors and you're saying, what the hell were you thinking? I realize you probably weren't going to go back to Shamrock for the second straight year. Um... But if anything, go with China. If anything, go with Kane. If anything, go with Big Show. Like those all seem to be more viable, sensible options than what we actually ended up with here. And it's like they put Billy Gunn in this tough spot. Rock, you could tell in that build up to SummerSlam 99 was pissed that he had to work with Mr. Ass. And at the time, as, as you could sit there and say, well, that's kind of bullshit. Like, you wouldn't think you'd want to totally tear down your opponent. You want to build him up so it makes you look better when you beat him. The reality is, is I kind of understand where The Rock was fucking coming from. Like, I'm the damn Rock. And, you know, this is my Jeff Jarrett. Austin didn't want to work with Double J. I don't want to work with Mr. Ass. And I'm going to make everybody fucking regret the decision to make me work a program with Mr. Ass. I totally and completely get it. It's petty. But if you were in the rock shoes, wouldn't you kind of understand? I think even Billy Gunn kind of understands all these years later. He's like, yeah, I probably wasn't really ready for that spot. And he certainly wasn't ready to deal in a program with the fucking rock. Like Billy Gunn in a mid-card role, Billy Gunn as part of a good tag team, like that was a place that made sense for him. You start to stretch him out above and beyond that, and it really kind of falls apart quickly, which is basically what really happened. But then when you bring him back into another tag team, like you do some really good stuff with him. Some good talent, just incredibly miscast here. 
your WWF championship match. You had The Undertaker defeat The Rock to retain his championship. And these are in the corporate ministry days, da-da-da. Obviously, the big plot twist here was Triple H coming in and interfering, costing The Rock his chance at the belt. It's an okay match. You know, again, like, not, not a top offering. But on this show, as it so often was the case with King of the Ring, the WWF Championship match was secondary. And not just to the King of the Ring final. Like, think about this. Billy Gunn versus X-Pac in the King of the Ring final was after the WWF Championship match. That's crazy to me. But the main event, as it should have been back in 1999, was Vince McMahon and Shane McMahon versus Stone Cold Steve Austin in a handicap ladder match for control of the World Wrestling Federation at stake. Y'all remember this story good because I'm not about to fucking revisit it all. You know, the, the one thing you look back at this time, those crash TV elements, how they would do these big shocking things and then a month later it's over and then they find the next thing and the next thing and it would go on and on and on. I even think about it from here, within a couple of months, Vince McMahon was fucking WWF champion. A little bit before that, by the time you're at SummerSlam, Stone Cold Steve Austin is walking in as WWF champion and dropping it to Mankind so Mankind can drop it to Foley the next night because while Hunter at the time could play some clicky politics, he couldn't play in Stone Cold Steve Austin politics. Those are elite level in and of themselves. You know, the whole premise before this was Vince McMahon was going to find a partner and then you bring in Steve Blackman and then Shane's caught on GTV. Y'all remember GTV? <laughs> you want to talk about the blast from the past to see Shane McMahon talking to the Mean Street Posse, GTV showing this, and of course, the commissioner, Shawn Michaels, sits there and says, no, 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 Shane McMahon is healthy enough to compete, so they have to go out there and... You know, ladder match, you have the shenanigans of when Austin tries to get on top of the ladder, the briefcase moves and so forth. Like this is, you know, this match is much more about emotion and the heat of the rivalry between the McMahon, McMahon boys and Stone Cold Steve Austin. That's what carries this. The crowd reactions um, and the story. Because the match is, eh, you know, it's, it's rough. <laughs> it's got Vince in it, so it's always going to be kind of Awkward, gangly, uncoordinated, and pretty unathletic. But you do a couple of spectacular-looking fucking things that help get you by. But you have people that know how to tell a damn story. Vince and Shane ultimately win. Shane gets the damn briefcase, and they wrestle back control of the WWF. But, you know, maybe if you were there in person, like this is a hot period of wrestling, obviously. Crowds were hot. You know, had some really hot, you know, next level type of characters, but watching this show back now, so it's pretty much a, a a must miss. None of the King of the Ring tournament matches were anything to write home about. I promise you. Um, you had the Hardy Boys and Edge and Christian wrestle for less than five minutes. Undertaker versus The Rock was good, but certainly nothing special or legendary. Austin versus the McMahons in the ladder match was cool. You know, they had some cool looking spots like when the ladders are all stacked up and Austin pulls it down and fucking ladders come down on top of the McMahons. Like some of that stuff looks cool. It doesn't, I don't think it holds up as well now in 2021. But this is a largely, honestly, forgettable show other than for one element. And that is Mr. Ass, Billy Gunn, winning King of the Ring, which you then immediately associate with him getting buried by The Rock in the build-up to in the eventual match at SummerSlam 1999. So it's not, wasn't one of their best offerings, that's for sure. You could say that about a lot of these King of the Ring shows, honestly. 